All right, I'm talking today with Ryan Holmberg. He is, what are you? <laughs> How would you describe yourself? Um, I'm a translator. I am, I'm a, started off as an art historian and became a comics historian, specifically of <clears throat> older Japanese comic books. Nice. And then I switched into translation while also doing historical writing. Uh, used to be an art critic, not really doing that anymore. But yeah, now now mainly translator and comics historian. Huh. When did you start learning Japanese? I was born in Japan. Oh, I didn't know that. I, um, that's the kind of research I would I would do if I had more time. <laughs> and I know that. born then I grew up partially in Japan, so I absorbed Japanese uh, in the eighties when I was uh, in elementary school, basically reading Shonen Jump in Japanese and playing Nintendo, playing family family computer. Huh. Whereabouts in Japan? Because I, I visited and kind of crossed the country at one point. But my uh, father, he worked at a, a naval air facility, a U.S. military base called Atsugi. Hmm. It's in Kanagawa Prefecture, uh, maybe about I don't know how many forty miles south of Tokyo. And we lived another, I guess, about twenty miles south of there in a place called Chigasaki near the beach. Yeah. Well, what so, are, one of my questions was going to be like how how long it took you to learn Japanese, but I guess that question is just totally <laughs> destroyed. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. You know, when I was growing up, I was there, born there, and then we went moved back to the states, and I went back from third grade to sixth grade. By the time I left in sixth grade, I was able to read hiragana, one of the main syllabaries, the letters system, letter sets. I couldn't read Chinese characters. But most manga, they have what's called furigana on the side, which tells you how the Chinese characters are pronounced. So I was able to read all of that. And I also gained a lot of vocabulary by playing things like um, Dragon Warrior, like role playing games. So those are very word based. So a lot of my Japanese vocabulary came from playing uh, computer based, Nintendo based role playing games. So already by, I still have like a very large vocabulary for types of armor and types of swords and types of spells, like things you would find in, in a world of D&D &D fantasy that you don't usually pick up at school. Oh, interesting. Well, I have your, uh, I don't know, is this your most recent book or no? Yeah, nothing's come out recently, but yeah, it's about, I guess it came out about a year ago now, maybe sometime last summer. That's the last translation project that's out i've since more or less completed three more uh all three are supposed to be coming out this summer so three more will be out this summer and this one yeah that's that's what that's what came out maybe last july or so are the other ones going to be from drawn and quarterly as well uh one from drawn and quarterly which is the sequel in the tsuge yoshiharu series it's called red flowers and oh, yeah, i saw that yeah a book from Glacier Bay Books. They're a new outfit in Oregon. It's uh, called F. It's a post -Fuk Fukushima dystopia graphic novel. And then uh, Baby Boom, a work by experimental cartoonist Yokoyama Yuichi, which will be out from Breakdown Press in London. Cool. So yeah. I'm, I'm curious to hear because uh, this this one to me was is one of the most unconventional <laughs> manga that I've ever read. Like. I don't consider myself as well read in manga as I'd like to be, but uh, this one, I mean, I've read from this era too, I've read um, a good amount. Six, I would say I've read more 60s and 70s manga than modern manga. Yeah. And, um, but even that this felt, I mean, the voices back then to me feel more diverse in a lot of ways. Like, yeah. but um, so how did, how did like you get started with translation and how much are you choosing these projects or are the publisher kind of, picking you to translate what they want? Uh, it's very rare or almost never that the publisher picks me to translate something that, something they've already licensed. Um, almost always the case is that I pitch them a project and then I'm the one who licenses it, licenses it or hooks them up with a Japan side agent who can license it. There's other ones that I haven't been involved in licensing, but it was kind of understood from the beginning that I would be the translator. 
because I am also oftentimes the essayist. So for example, the Tsugiyoshi Haru series from B&Q, which will be seven volumes, um, I wasn't directly involved in the licensing of that, but it was understood from the beginning that I would be the translator and co-essayist huh. for that series. Yeah, so these like are- the, the, this, So this book, for example, there, you know, I would say about half my books are based completely or largely on editions that already exist in Japan. So even when, even in the case of anthologies, so in the case of Sky is Blue, there is a collection of uh, Tsurita's work in Japanese called Flight. It came out maybe about 10 years ago. And in Italy, France, and I think Spain, they did a straight up edition of the Japanese edition, which is about 400 pages of comics and then a shorter essay. But the decision, mainly my decision was made to make a, a shorter collection of comics, add one or two that aren't in the Japanese edition that would help kind of explain the trajectory more and mm -hmm. kind of bring to the fore some of the gender issues that I talk about in the essay. And then uh, rewrite, the, rewrite the essay basically based on the Japanese essay. Because the Japanese essay was written by Asakawa, the co-editor. And he, I think he wrote it uh, fairly quickly, but he also didn't address certain issues that I knew uh, English language readers would be interested in, uh, particularly gender issues. So that's what I beefed it out with. Do you, do you find that some of these books like, like this, uh, are they more popular, do you think, in the U.S. than in Japan, actually? This one's far more popular in the U.S., or yeah. in the West than in Japan. I, I don't know that. how many, I don't know how many copies that sold in Japan, but I think at this point, her name is much better known outside of, out of, uh, out of uh, outside of Japan. Why do you think that is? I mean, maybe you addressed it in the, the, the essay. Why do I think that is? Um, I don't know. I think in Japan, you know, it's, it's their own comics history and there's certain like patterns that have already set, like there's certain eras that represent certain things and certain artists that represent those eras. Er, eras. So someone like Tsurita Kuniko doesn't fit within the mold of any of those. You know, when you talk about Gato and alt manga, especially from that era, you're usually talking about stuff done by men. It's usually fairly dark and serialistic and you can describe her stuff that way too but it doesn't actually, it doesn't fit the mold of what people think, um, you know, Gato like manga is in Japan all the time. And most of the fans of stuff like they're from Gato are men in Japan. Um, and then people who are interested in women's comics, they're not going to be interested in Gato usually, you know, by the 1980s Gato, the magazine she was writing for had a larger number of uh, female artists but she was the only main one in the late 60s and 70s. So people who are interested in women's comics, they're gonna be interested in shoujo manga or in what's called just women's comics, you know, comics by women for an, a more mature audience, an adult audience that got really big in the 1980s and 90s. So she doesn't really fit those, I don't know what you call it, like those, those, those preset or standardized uh, markets or reading, reading audiences. She kind of falls in between them. Well, what but I like, you know, in the West, they don't, I guess, I think, like in the United States, they don't necessarily have a built out understanding of what was supposed to be important in manga history. So I think there's a little bit, a lot more freedom to like be able to read something for what it is rather than within a, within a context of a preset context. I think I, I certainly have a much less better uh, i don't have a good understanding of you know the, the the wider trends from this era so i think that's for me i just pick it up and uh I, w I wonder if i had not known this was a woman if i would be able to tell i feel like there is a different voice to it certainly and um for people that don't know she died pretty young like 37 correct and i can't once, remember the exact age but yeah it's but pretty young like lupus yeah. right yeah yeah and uh so it's hard to, i mean you could see some of the some of the, the some of the comics are a little rough around the edges, but you can see her development, and you can see it, it's just hard to imagine 
how much she would have, how further she would have gone if she had been allowed to live. So, um, For sure. I, I really rec I, I liked it. It was very unique. So, um, I'm looking forward to finishing the essay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it represents about, like I said, we cut a bunch of stories for the uh, English edition, but even the Japanese edition is not all of her work. I mean, what you're seeing there represents probably about half of her output in Gato and related venues. Hmm. She did some work for uh, more popular magazines in the 60s, but that represents about half of her entire output over her life. Do you find uh, when you're translating, are you are you actually doing the lettering in English? I don't do the I don't do the lettering. Okay. I just do I do the translation. Do you find ever that there's like difficult? I'm I'm sure there's difficult things to translate, but things that require like notes or to really explain, or is it you just you can usually find an English equivalent? I usually find an English equivalent. You know, sometimes some things just are Japan specific, so you explain it in a gutter, you know, below the panel. And if there's some like wider context that needs to be explained, I usually do that in the essay. But, you know, like things like certain kinds of wordplay, you try to find a rough equivalence. You know that, you know that the exact wordplay is gonna be lost, but you find something that's gonna be readable and has the same kind of sensibility or the same, same gravitas or same humor in English, even if the metaphors get switched out. Hmm. There seems to be also with with translations like a trend away from I don't know if you I'm sure you know these but like where they mirror the art and they so that it reads from left to right like a, like a Western book. Yeah, I mean, I the books I've done I've only done that on a couple, and usually, you know, one should get permission from the artist to do that, and the ones that books that I've done in which the the work the artwork has been flipped, we got the permission from the artist. And those books are the Tsuge Tadao books. There's yeah. Slum Wolf from New York Review of Comics and Trash Market from B&Q. And he was okay with flipping it. So first, on the one side is getting permission from the artists. And the second is, does the publisher want to go through the labor of flipping all the panels? And then if there's any signage, unflipping the signage. And then, doing, and then if you flip the artwork, that means you're also committed to um, replacing all the sound effects with English sound effects. So it's a lot more labor if you want to flip out, flip the artwork. And until recently, you know, people now with the, with so many people reading manga from when they're young, I don't think that many people are turned off by the fact that the book is backwards if you do it the Japanese style. But even when I started doing translation, even, I don't know, however long ago that was, 10 years or whatever, or it, at that point, still people were really concerned that the, the book looked backwards to people who were coming into a bookstore and didn't know anything about manga. The book looked broken. So they were really intent on wanting to flip stuff if they could. Huh. I don't right. think that's, that's not the case anymore. And it seems like a lot of work just to, because people are too lazy to reach a different direction. And I think though the, the way they do it now, well, not, not in this one, but a lot of times they'll They'll, because they'll have like an essay that they can have that at the beginning to right, kind of yeah. give you a hint of the actual direction. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, to me, it's like dubbing of anime or whatever. It's just like, just put subtitles in. I don't want to hear dubbed. I um, mean, there are, there are cases like, you know, some manga, some manga that are, you know, more action-based and less word-based more visually oriented mm -hmm. that they are designed that you read very smoothly from right to left through the images and if you start putting a lot of text that reads left to right as english does there are times when it kind of slows down or trips up the reading flow um but you know those, those cases are few and far between and probably what you lose by flipping it is outmatched by the slowing down of the the, the reading speed reading right. flow yeah well it seems like we're seeing less of the mirrored stuff so i'm hoping it just goes away altogether um, yeah. how, how did you so your first project of translation how did that come about i was i was trying to find a bridge between academia and 
things that weren't academia uh, for various reasons. One of those things was it was kind of, I knew that it would in the long term it might be difficult to have a full-time career in academia doing comics, writing about comics. So, you know, I was also, I also believe that if, if most manga, if, if the really special manga are worth writing about, they're, they're worth also translating. So the, a lot of the stuff that at the time that, that I was interested in wasn't in translation. So I thought that it was, you know, partially, if I wanted to see in translation, it was up to me to kind of bring it over. So I started doing that. I also, there was a time when I wanted to start working freelance, get out of teaching. So I started translation as a way to create kind of a paid platform for my writing because the translation can pay okay. But if you were to calculate all the time I put into writing the essays, it works out to be pennies on the hour if I'm lucky. So it was really the doing the translation was to kind of create a paid platform for my research. But also, I really like the full package. You have the translation, you have the essay together, and then it's a, it's a whole book, you know, rather than having like an, a, uh, an academic essay that's floating around in some kind of academic journal or online that no one can really access. So I, I, like, I like the full package of doing the books. Yeah, I like the essays too. I think they, because uh, especially for American readers, we just have no context for a lot of the cultural references and locations. So yeah. I do like them. Um, what about like, uh, you said you have, so you, you have three projects coming ahead. So how long do these typically take you to do like say a 200 page translation? I can do the, uh, depend, it obviously depends on how many words are in it, but 200 pages, I can do the first draft in anywhere from three days to a week. Oh, wow. A week being five days, you know? Huh. And the other book that's coming out that I've announced that won't be out until uh january or february is um another tsuge tadao book called boat life that'll be coming out from floating world comics um but that took me about two weeks because there's eight panels per page and each panel has at least one speech balloon that was definitely the most time consuming uh translation that translation i've done oh that just reminds me actually that floating world comics i did have another comics interview we were talking about people that I interviewed, uh, Steve Aylett. I don't know if you know his name. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a writer. He has a comic coming out in July uh, oh. from Floating World. But um, yeah, but anyways. Um, oh, so I was thinking about translation. So uh, because you seem to largely be choosing your projects, do you feel like there's like, I, I have no idea. Like, do you feel like there's tons and tons of great manga waiting to be translated? Or do you feel like we've gotten a pretty good sampling in the West of the broad outlines at this point. Uh, there's definitely huge gaps, the broad outlines, it's coming together. It's hmm. coming together. I, I, you know, I think in my mind, I have a general plan and this plan will not go as planned, but it's my basic idea is to kind of finish fleshing out the sixties and, and 70s, early seventies of Gato manga, alt manga. And then kind of leave that, leave, leave the, leave whatever's left over for somebody else. But like, you know, the, the Tsuge Yoshihara series is doing a DNQ. It's seven volumes. You only just finished volume two. So that's going to go for the next five years. And by the time that's done, you'll have one of the major Gato artists almost fully out into English. So I think by the time that's done, I'll, I'll have exhausted all I want to do about Gato in the 60s and 70s. But I'm already moving in, already trying to move into older things and some newer things. But you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of gaps. There's not a lot of pre-war manga, pre-World War II manga in translation. There's not much manga from the occupation period or the early 50s in translation. So basically the stuff, you know, before the 60s. It is it's also, you know, the stuff that's older. It's in translation. It also tends to the more literary and arty stuff, just because it's more easily publishable and marketable in the West as graphic novels or literary comics or art comics, what have you. And the other thing is like a lot of, you know, a lot of titles for mainstream magazines, they go on for thousands and thousands of pages. And this is the case going back at least to the 19, late 1950s. So it's hard to bring that stuff out into translation because 
you're gonna have you're gonna have to spread it out across anywhere from three t- telephone book fat volumes to 10, 20, 30 volumes. Right. And there's just not a market necessarily for older stuff typically. There's right. exceptions to that, but for the most part, that stuff will probably never see the light of day just because even if it's super famous and important, just because there's too many pages. So what would you recommend or I mean, I, I don't know how, because you can translate so fast, like it, I'm saying, I always try to to kind of provide a portal for people that are interested in similar work. Would you recommend uh, people getting into translation or you, uh, do you feel like there's not enough publishers and not enough? Um, well, that, I'll say one thing. I mean, yeah, it might take me that long to do the first draft, but then you go over it numerous times to fix it to smooth it out or correct error, errors or whatever have you. So I would say all in all, maybe one book of that length takes me probably, if I had to add up all the hours spread out, probably about two weeks to do the actual translation till it's in its final form. And then, the, you know, the essays will take me a month or two. So that's where the bulk of the time goes. And usually why books get delayed, not because the translation's behind schedule, but because I take too long writing the essays. Even though I write them fast, they just take a long time. But your your question about should people get into it? No, there's not, there's not there's not a lot of money involved. There's very little money. You know, the, the reason I, the reason I'm able to do it freelance right now. I mean, I don't I don't make much money at all. But the reason I can do it is I do different types of translation projects. I also translate for I translate art catalogs. For museums. I have a couple art related corporate type things that I do once in a while. Um, so that stuff brings in a much higher rate for translation. And then sometimes I write essays for museums um, or other venues. So I have different streams of income. And the other reason that I'm able to make money off the translations is that I also package not just translation, but you know, doing the agent and the essay all together. Hmm. So if you have a, some projects you have to have an agent, an independent agent, just because the Japan side, people want an agent, Japan side agent. But if you can not have to pay an agent 1% or 2% off of a book's proceeds, then you're saving a lot more money. So some of the, some of the books I've done are, that are smaller print runs, like a thousand or 2000, they're, they're even, I don't even know if they're even feasible because I do all the work together. They don't have to pay other people to do it. So, so really you wouldn't recommend people doing it as the primary work. You, like you, you have to diversify with other, either teaching there's, or. There's a, there's a number of people who make a living doing manga translation. I don't know how many people, but you know, they, you know, some people look at my, bibliography and say oh wow you've done two dozen books but for people who do it full full time it's nothing they'll do that many in a year um you know they'll, they'll have done translated dozens or hundreds of books by the time they've been in the industry as long as i have i mean i'm you know i'm in my mid 40s but i've only been doing translation for about i guess about 10 years so huh. do you, do you have other, it? there's a, a, other people have been doing it since they were very young so at this point, do you have a, a dream project or any artist that you really want to get to? Uh, all the ones that I want to do, I'm trying to license now. I mean, one, one artist that I've wanted to do for a long time is uh, Shirato Sampe. He's the artist who founded Garo. And I've made feeble attempts to try to license some of his work. I might try again soon. But, you know, he... Sometimes it's hard when the artists are represented in Japan by major publishers like Kodansha or Shogakukan, because mm. those publishers have their own wings in the English language market. So it's harder f- to convince them to allow to allow them to license their artists to smaller unaffiliated publishers. And Shirato Sampe is one case. Huh. Interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you too about your. Uh non well non-translation book uh the translator without talent no. what, so what so what is that i yeah so this is a it's a 400 page book it was published by bubbles zine they're mm-hmm. in richmond uh bubbles done about i guess 10 or 11 issues over the past few years 
some stuff about manga, but also about comics more broadly. But uh, Brian did Brian, who runs Bubbles. He did a trend. He did an interview with me a couple of years ago about my work as a translator. And then I started doing Instagram uh, pretty aggressively, maxing out the the letter count on Instagram, like doing these little mini mini reports and mini historical essays on Instagram. So Brian and I we got together a couple of years ago and kind of I don't know who made the joke, but the kind of joke was like, let's make a Let's make a zine out of your best Instagram posts. And what was supposed to be a zine grew to a 400 page book. So um, it's basically a zine that turned into a book. It's an Instagram account that turned into a zine that turned into a book. So what it is, is it's a long essay about my kind of amateurish thoughts about translation. And then, you know, a lot of images with little uh, different types of explanation, historical explanations explanations about background of certain translation projects, research projects, and my uh, outings uh, meeting uh, famous manga artists. Nice. So I was, I was teaching in Tokyo for two years between 2017 and 2019. So it covers that, that period. And we're hoping to do a sequel, maybe next year, a sequel will come out. Nice. It's um, blanking on my question that I had. Oh, Instagram. So do you use Instagram for promotion and a lot? I do that too. I mean, how, how did you b grow your Instagram? I think you're, you're about over 6,000, right? How did I grow it? I don't know. Just doing just people like to read about manga. So there, there's that. And I, you know, I work with publishers that have a bit of a reach into that world. So people followed me um, from there, but you know, like before I did Instagram, you know, you, you read, read a lot of comics, a lot of old comics, you take notes and you never end up writing about them just because you just can't write about everything or not everything makes it into essays. So I have like all these like little scraps on my computer, I don't know where they are, and images and I don't know where they are about things that I've found that just never worked out into an essay. In that sense, like the, if you read this book, Translator Without Talent, you'll see that it's, it's organized by date, but thematically it goes all over the place. But it's just basically kind of like an assemblage of research notes. And sometimes those research notes got improved and worked up into parts of essays. And sometimes they just never made it into an essay. Sometimes they weren't designed to be an essay. Sometimes, you know, 200 words is enough for a topic or a, a certain kind of find, some kind of comic book. So as I see it, it's like, it's a way to kind of like package and archive all that other stuff in the past, you know, the, all that stuff that I didn't write about in the past, that's not like lost on my computer or somewhere in a box. So it's kind of, it's kind of useful in that way to like archive finds that aren't article worthy or I just don't have time to turn them into a part of an article. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I am curious about how, how popular like alt manga is in, in America. And I really have no idea the numbers. Like I know, I feel like modern, manga and modern anime are very popular, but like 60s and 70s old manga, I have really no Well, idea. I mean, it depends on what publisher it's coming out of, because if you're a bigger publisher, you have a bigger reach and can get it into better distribution. And also bigger publishers have better connections with libraries, like selling books to public libraries, accounts for some bigger publishers for maybe, I don't know, maybe 400 or 500 copies. Which is who, quite a, who are the biggest publishers in America for manga? Oh, for manga, I mean, the stuff, I, I mean, you have like Kodansha and Viz in these places doing the major titles that are connected to anime that you find on wherever, Crunchyroll or Netflix or whatever. But the stuff I work on would be D&Q or um, New York Review of Comics, who've done a couple of books. There's other publishers. But, you know, this is... This is not an actual sales figure, but you know, typically for books like these, like if you can sell three thousand copies, you've um, you've made a bit of money, and everyone is happy enough that they don't regret doing the projects. <laughs> yeah, but it's not necessarily enough to do another one of the same artist. So three thousand is kind of like the sweet spot of like, okay, that was that was worth doing, right? If you do 5,000, it's like, let's do another one. 
Yeah. So that, that's how that's how many readers these things have. Yeah. But manga, manga, like you know, I, I don't know sales numbers, but I would guess that some of the the bigger manga titles, or even the standard, the default manga titles, from places like Viz or Kodansha, the, those those might sell anywhere from seven thousand to twelve thousand copies or more. So it's a totally it's a totally different scale of market. That, that's why I was. I mean, that's about the numbers I would expect. But like, that's why I was curious about your Instagram. Like, uh, if the audience seems to, if there's like a connection between people. Well, that you know, the Insta Instagram. Oh, six thousand. That's what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many of those are bots. So probably about 500, <laughs> 500 bots. But you know, the the book. You know, the book. This translator without talent. It's it's mainly re publishing things I already published on Instagram. But Instagram being, so first of all, a pain to like scroll back and look at old posts, but also very few people want to read a long text on their uh, inside Instagram. So I know a lot of people who like look like my images but don't read the texts because they just can't make the effort on their phones. So I, I know I, a few people have told me they were glad that. The book came out that way. They was they compelled them to actually read the texts in a way that was readable. But you know, I have six thousand followers or whatever it is, maybe some, almost six thousand five hundred. But you know, the book has sold with zero marketing, about seven hundred copies. So I mean, we we didn't think it would sell that much as all. Well. We initially we did five hundred. We're like we're going to be sitting on two hundred copies for the next five years, but that it, that turned out not to be the case. So. Yeah, I think that, I think it's just a matter of reaching. There is an interest in this. It's just you know reaching the people to letting letting them know about it is difficult. Yeah. Nice. Well, I hope this helps uh, in any way. At least brings at least even if it brings one reader. I'm always I'm happy to help people get some audience. This is so. This is one of the most recent books. Sky is blue right. with a single cloud. I recommend this one. Um, you've done other ones. The man without talent. Right. So there's a whole recently. Uh, I have a web page. That was. Uh, I'll very, link to that too. I'll very, link to all your stuff very, below. Very kindly and beautifully designed and coded by my girlfriend. Oh, cool. Whose name is Lauren, but she created it. It went up about a month or two ago. It's at mangaberg.com, and there you'll find a full and very visually oriented bibliography of everything I've written and translated for the most part. So nice. And and your next book to be released is September, next, right? Um, the next book that definitely coming out is that the, it's locked in the, the date is Red Flowers, the volume two in the Tsuke series from B and Q. That will be out in August. The book from Glacier Bay Books could be out from any anywhere from next month to two months from now, and Baby Boom will also be out this summer. And there might be one or two other books that come out before the, man, the end of the year. The Man Without Talent is Tsuge, right? That's Tsuge, but it came out from a different publisher. Okay, and then the first volume of the Tsuge short stories. Well, I read that one too. What was that called? Swamp. Swamp. I like I like that one. I would say more than. Man. I mean, I like Man Without Talent. But oh, really? I like. I feel like that was a little more, not conventional, but the stories because they're short stories. They're just. I, I tend to like the short story format um, for the sixties and seventies manga for some reason. Like uh, Yoshi, Yoshiharu Tatsumi. Is that how you say the name? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. his his stuff, I like a lot. Um, but and also this this one you just did the sky is blue. I, I just like I mean, this short story format. Yeah. I mean, most Gato artists it changes more in the seventies and eighties, but most Gato artists did short stories, you know, yeah. from eight to twenty or thirty pages long. So if you're doing alt manga, you're usually doing short story collections just by the nature of what was produced. Cool. Well, I'm. I would recommend people, yeah, the the first volume of the Tsuke short stories or Swamp or this one, or also that one that's coming out, volume two. I'm that one I'm looking forward to a lot. So thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, I cool. think it's thank good you. stuff. All all the ones I've read I've enjoyed. Um I even saw you did a translation of uh what was it called? About it was like I'm blanking now. It it's it was an older art style, uh oh, Last of the Mohicans. And mm. the art, the art in that just looks for it looks so. What, when did when did that come out? The art looks so. Um, that was the first. That was the first book project that I not the first thing I translated, but the first thing that was my idea, and I did all the the, the back end work too. Oh, but I mean the but, original, like when, when the, did original the original one. It came out in seventy one or seventy two. 
Cool. I, I want to check that one out because the the art just looks so ridiculous. It's well, it's not it's not that popular of a book, and it didn't sell well. And then the publisher dumped all the remaining copies, so you can pick up a copy probably for about five bucks on Amazon. Nice. Okay. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you very much, Ryan, for uh, yeah, coming on you. to talk about all this stuff. It's fascinating stuff to me, and uh, I hope people check out these books. I think they're great. All right. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks, Ryan.